Good morning. The sixth plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. The Assembly will hear an address of His Excellency Weifel Ramkelawan, President of the Republic of Seychelles. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Wafer Ramkelawan, President of the Republic of Seychelles, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President of the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish, uh, first of all, to congratulate Ambassador Dennis Francis on his election as President of the 78th Session of the United Nations General Assembly and extend our best wishes of success in his tenure of office. We also thank his predecessor, Ambassador Sabah Korosi, for his steadfast leadership over the preceding session. Excellencies, Trust and solidarity form the bedrock of a functional multilateral order. 78 years ago, the United Nations was founded with the aim of preventing future global conflicts, promoting international cooperation, and maintaining peace and security among nations. The lessons of history are clear unwavering commitment to meaningful cooperation and dedication to global peace and security are essential to enhance human existence and prevent the recurrence of past tragedies. As the challenge to global peace, security, and prosperity takes on new dimensions, the lessons of the past become even more relevant. The world stands at the brink, facing conflicts and wars and human-induced disasters, while countless people continue to struggle for a decent existence. Disunity and distrust threaten to paint a bleak future, void of hope and possibilities. Overcoming this predicament demands that we find common ground amidst division. As we gather here today at the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly, we are confronted with the urgent need to rebuild trust and reignite global solidarity in order to accelerate action on the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals. Only through collective action can we achieve the vision of a better world for all. At the heart of our discussion lies the 2030 Agenda, a transformative blueprint for sustainable development. It serves as a roadmap to eradicate poverty, promote human rights, protect our planet, and ensure that no one is left behind. Yet, as we review our progress, it is evident that we are falling short of our targets and the global pandemic has further exacerbated the challenges before us. Now, more than ever, we must renew our commitment to the SDGs and take decisive action to fulfill our promises. We are lagging behind. At the midway point of Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, it is crucial that we accelerate our joint efforts to make transformative advancements on the SDGs. The latest SDG report paints a somber picture of lost progress or regression on over 30% of the targets, with vulnerable countries facing inequality, poverty, hunger, and environmental degradation. Addressing these imbalances and advancing the SDGs 
can only be achieved through collective action. To accelerate action on the SDGs, we must prioritize implementation at all levels. This necessitates the alignment of national policies, plans, and strategies with the objectives of the 2030 Agenda. It requires robust institutions capable of driving progress and delivering results. It demands innovative financing mechanisms, as well as increased investment in sustainable infrastructure, technology transfer, and capacity building. We must foster an enabling environment for entrepreneurship, innovation, and inclusive economic growth, while also addressing the root causes of inequality, poverty, and environmental degradation. Furthermore, we must harness the power of partnerships. The achievement of the SDGs requires collaboration between governments, civil society, the private sector, and international organizations. By forging strategic alliances, we can leverage resources, expertise, and influence to catalyze change. South-South cooperation, in particular, holds great potential for knowledge exchange and mutually beneficial development. We must also reaffirm our commitment to multilateralism as the United Nations serves as the cornerstone of our collective efforts towards peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability. Excellencies, Seychelles, through processes like the African Peer Review Mechanism and the Voluntary National Review, seeks to consolidate gains from prevailing political and socioeconomic successes. We stand ready to share our experiences and strengthen cooperation with other countries. However, rebuilding confidence in the SDGs requires transforming words into concrete actions. Firstly, development partners must deliver on the Addis Ababa Action Agenda by scaling up financing and means of implementing the SDGs. Secondly, international institutions should embrace reform to ensure that the unique needs of vulnerable countries are considered in access to development financing. Seychelles firmly believes in the critical importance of adopting a multidimensional vulnerability index that fully responds to the needs of small island developing states. Thirdly, we need to leverage effective financing mechanisms such as impact investments, public-private partnerships, and debt relief to yield greater results for development agendas like Agenda 2063 and the forthcoming outcome of the fourth SEEDS conference in 2024. The Secretary General's SDG stimulus aimed at transforming the global financial system is commendable, and international financial institutions must collaborate to support our collective ambition for a sustainable future. Redressing these imbalances and advancing on the SDGs will only be achieved if we work together. If we are to make progress on our development agenda, we can no longer call what we are facing climate change. The point at which lives and livelihoods are lost with frightening frequency due to environmental disasters means that we are living through a climate crisis. Addressing the climate crisis is no longer optional. It is an immediate necessity. To quote the Secretary General, the era of global warming has transitioned into an era of global boiling, and leaders must lead to limit the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. Seychelles is committed to renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
But as a small island developing state, we lack the capacity and infrastructure to develop these solutions fully. OECD and G20 countries as major emitters must take decisive actions to lead in combating climate change. The establishment of the Loss and Damage Fund is a positive step, but its operationalization is crucial to compensate those most at risk. Nature-based solutions exemplified by Seychelles' pioneering of blue bonds and the blue economy showcase the potential for sustainable development. Transparent ocean governance offers opportunities for development and environmental protection. In this context, I pay tribute to the bold actions of seeds such as Bermuda and Tonga, which have purposefully moved to harnessing wave energy as feasible solutions to independent and clean energy futures. Seychelles will continue the same ambitious approach as we assume the presidency of the seeds dock from Tonga. Furthermore, the Seeds Coalition for Nature, launched by Seychelles, Belize, Cabo Verde, and Samoa, is mobilizing support for ambitious biodiversity targets. This is clear evidence that Seeds continue to lead by example, doing more than our fair share to alleviate the pressure being exerted on our planet. It is through such trust-building cooperation that we will obtain impactful outcomes as demonstrated by the recent adoption of the High Seas Treaty. Excellencies, to achieve the SDGs and ensure peace, prosperity and progress and sustainability for all, we must embrace the interconnectedness of our world. Climate change knows no boundaries, poverty respects no borders and the quest for peace requires a collective effort. Seychelles, as a nation uniquely positioned amidst the vast Indian Ocean, knows firsthand the significance of global cooperation in addressing climate change, ocean conservation, sustainable development, and maritime security. Seychelles remains committed to its pioneering role in marine conservation protecting vast areas of our ocean and marine ecosystems, but we cannot succeed alone. We call upon the global community to prioritize sustainability, transition to clean energy, and preserve our ecosystems for the prosperity of all. Last but not least, as we rebuild from the pandemic, we must do so with an unwavering commitment to inclusivity. No one should be left behind. We must invest in healthcare systems, education, and social safety nets that guarantee the well being of every citizen. We must promote gender equality, empower youth, and create opportunities for marginalized communities. Inclusivity is not just a goal. It is the cornerstone of a just and equitable world. Excellencies, to conclude, rebuilding trust is paramount. Trust is the foundation on which nations cooperate, and it is through trust that we foster meaningful partnerships and collaborations. We must rekindle trust among nations, between governments and citizens, and across various sectors of society. This requires transparent and accountable governance, bolstered by an unwavering dedication to the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. By doing so, we can restore the faith of our people and mobilize their active participation in the pursuit of sustainable development. Our success hinges on global solidarity. The challenges we face are interconnected and transcend national boundaries. No nation can solve them in isolation. Therefore, 
we must strengthen our bonds of solidarity, cooperation, and mutual support. This includes sharing experiences, knowledge, and best practices, as well as providing assistance to those most in need. The principle of leaving no one behind should guide our actions, ensuring that the most vulnerable among us receive the support they require. Let us rise above our differences and work together for a better world. Rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity is not just an option, it is the only way forward. Together, we can accelerate action on the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals, creating a world that embraces diversity, respects nature, and ensures a future of peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability for all. I thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Seychelles for the statement made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Paul Kagama, President of the Republic of Rwanda, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Excellency Denis Francis, President of the General Assembly, Excellency Secretary General Antonio Guterres, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This year, the World Health Organization declared that COVID pandemic is no longer a global health emergency. Recovery is well underway, but unfortunately, the starting line was not the same for all of us across different regions. This year's SDG summit has once again raised the alarm about slow pace of SDG implementation, and I commend the Secretary General for the sharp focus he is bringing to this issue. Developing countries are constrained by a debt crisis, including higher costs of borrowing, this is causing economic disparities to widen and slowing down our collective progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. The primary cause of this crisis is high interest rates in developed economies in order to correct for years of quantitative easing. At the same time, Developing countries face exaggerated risk premiums for both currency and political risk, which are simply unjustified. We need serious cooperation to address this. In developing countries, we also have a responsibility to be accountable for the quality of our financial governance and the management of our natural resources. Increasing access to finance also requires reform of our global financial institutions. In this regard, we welcome the proposals of the Bridgetown Initiative, as well as the Paris Summit for a new global financing pact. Rwanda also supports the second replenishment of the Green Climate Fund to create the fiscal space for vulnerable nations to tackle climate change. Africa and small island developing states, many of which are represented in the Commonwealth, 
want to work with the partners and be part of the solution. That is an important outcome of the recent African Climate Summit held in Nairobi under the leadership of President William Ruto. However, we must not only cool down on climate, we must also cool down on conflict. Today, there is no sign of ongoing conflicts ending anytime soon. We do not even see hope from those with the most influence that an end is in sight. Innocent lives are left alone to carry the burden of this instability. That is a profound injustice. The migration crisis is a case in a point. Every year, migrants and refugees undertake dangerous journeys in search of a better future. Rwanda remains committed to working with partners, including the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, to contribute to a durable solution. This decision is informed by our experience and knowing firsthand the pain of losing everything and not having a place to call home. That is part of our promise to leave no one behind. We continue to need a more effective forum to manage global crises. That's why the United Nations was created in the first place. However, that does not absolutely absolve any country or region of the responsibility to address the governance shortfalls which are the root cause of instability. In this regard, I welcome the Secretary General's report on a new agenda for peace. Bilateral interventions to which Rwanda contributes actively in various places can provide a rapid response to a crisis situation. But to have a lasting effect, the need to pave the way for multilateral engagement and international political progress. No matter the amount of troops deployed, the mindset should be to get results which serve the interests of the people on the ground. Paying lip service to peace and getting lost in process and formalities only serves to confirm the selective attention of some in the international community. We still have a long way to go. Africa urgently needs to be fully represented in bodies where decisions concerning our future are made. Just as urgently, Africa must be fully prepared to speak with one voice. Ultimately, a more effective development cooperation framework must give equal weight to everyone's needs and priorities. That is what builds fair and equal partnerships and a more just and peaceful world. That's what we all claim to want, even as we too frequently fall short. In that spirit, allow me to commend the United Nations Development Program, led by Akim Steiner, for the Timbuktu Initiative to strengthen the African startup innovation ecosystem. This week, 
the International Telecommunications Union, led by Doreen Bodan Martin, together with UNDP, unveiled a major new initiative on inclusive digital public infrastructure. Rwanda is very happy to be associated with these efforts, which show the United Nations at its best. For Rwanda, the source of our solidarity comes from our commitment to never allowing a repetition of the tragedy that was inflicted on us nearly 30 years ago. We continue to remain grateful to all who have accompanied us on our journey as we plan to commemorate the genocide against the Tutsi for the 30th time in April 2024. To conclude, I look forward to welcoming leaders at the third United Nations Conference on landlocked developing countries, which Rwanda will host in June 2024. I thank you for your kind attention. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Rwanda for the statement made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Nikos Christodolides, President of the Republic of Cyprus. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Nikos Christodolides, President of the Republic of Cyprus, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, on the 26th of July 1946, in San Francisco, our predecessors pledged to save succeeding generations from the sketch of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. To unite our strength to maintain international peace and security. To settle their international disputes by peaceful means and refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. These pledges were the promise of our predecessors bestowed upon us for the future. The UN Charter, ladies and gentlemen, is a promise, not a reality. If we are com complacent in our actions, the words are not worth the paper on which they are written. The horrors of the Second World War, which began in Europe and consumed the world, brought the nations together. We, assembled here today, must live up to the obligations prescribed in the UN Charter to proclaim never again. Make no mistake, we bear responsibility to ensure the world does not drift into the horror of war. This is our mandate. Do we have the courage? Do we have the resolve to make peace our top priority, to honor the foundations of the United Nations and to assure its continued relevance? Our predecessors harbored an admirable sense of their own personal accountability to the future. I believe it is that sense of personal responsibility from the individual that underpins the idea and the reality of a United Nations throughout the world. Our predecessors also knew that the path to peace will be challenging. They had the resolve, the deep belief, the knowledge that it will require the ability of all people to come together to make peace a reality, so that their children and the generations to come, so that our children today will not be scarred by another world war. But they also had the greatest of all impetuses. The world, the leaders that came before us, inherited ashes, not institutions. 
They had no choice but to look to multilateralism, to international law, respect for the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all states. Today, as we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors, we remain accountable to deliver on the vision of peace that sparked the creation of this resilient organization. Will we be healthy and equal to the challenge? Can we act with a sense of urgency without which we too will fail? Excellencies, as a historian by training, I believe adamantly that history serves as an invaluable compass as the most valuable sources, source of lessons. More than seven decades following the establishment of the United Nations, the war in Ukraine has shaken the world. It reminds us that never again is a rallying cry, a sacred promise that is fragile and one that we need to protect with all of our resolve. Cyprus condemns in the strongest terms any breach of international peace and security affected through military action by any state against the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of another state. We stand on this instance of violation of international law and on every such instance on the right side of history. Since the very first day of the aggression against Ukraine, the people of Cyprus, a third of them, still displaced as a result of foreign aggression against their own country, have displayed solidarity with deeds, not just words, to the people of Ukraine. We do this because we remember. We do this because it is the right thing to do. Excellencies, we call for the immediate cessation of hostilities and encourage the parties to engage in constructive dialogue and negotiation. The world must support this effort, not only because history demands it, but also to ensure the world steps back from the edge of a war that could reduce this institution to rubble. Mr. President, the invasion of Ukraine is not the first instance that use of force was used against a sovereign nation in Europe following World War II. Just like Ukraine in Cyprus, the UN Charter and international law continue to be violated. In 1974, Turkey invaded Cyprus and since then, 49 years on, occupies European territory and its people, Greek Cypriots and Turkey Cypriots, continue to suffer the consequences of invasion, occupation and division. They are deprived of their fundamental freedoms and human rights. Europe, which decades ago witnessed the worst horrors humankind has ever committed against self, remains fractured as long as Cyprus is divided. Born in 1973, only a few months before Turkey invaded Cyprus, I have witnessed my people more, persevere, rebuild, forever with a burning desire for peace and reunification. The invasion violently displaced hundreds of thousands of Cypriots and Turkey continues to occupy approximately 37% of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus. The families of the missing persons desperately await for information on the fate of their loved ones. The enclaves stoically await the end of the division. One of the lessons we are reminded of by the recent invasion of Ukraine is that in the absence of lasting, viable peace, the resulting fragility can lead to destabilization with far-reaching consequences, not just for the country concerned, but for the region to which it belongs and for the world at large. Ukraine has exemplified in the darkest manner that a threat to peace somewhere is a threat to peace everywhere. In the absence of a peace path and process in Cyprus, there is a serious risk and one that we have, mater we have seen materialized in the recent past of further violations of international law which create instability and with ramifications well beyond Cyprus. We have witnessed the Turkish military forces perpetrate further violations in Varosha, the fence area of Famagusta. 
Since 1974, Varosha has been held hostage and rendered a ghost town, contrary to UN Security Council resolutions that call for its return to its lawful inhabitants who left their livelihoods, their dreams, and their hopes between those fences. We have witnessed in our maritime zones, and we have witnessed more recently in the buffer zone, where attacks on UN peacekeepers by Turkish forces horrified and alerted Sansuas again to the urgency of peace in Cyprus. That is why the resumption of negotiations firmly anchored on the agreed framework is my absolute priority. The current status quo cannot be the future of Cyprus. It cannot be the future for Cypriots. As president of the Republic of Cyprus, I believe in peaceful coexistence because despite growing up in a divided country, I also grew up in a country filled with hope or reunification to stories of all Cypriots living together in peace, united by the land they shared. The new generation of Cypriots is also eager for peace, and that gives me hope and courage. Ahead of my journey to New York, I received a plethora of messages from my Turkish Cypriot compatri compatriots, particularly from the younger generation, calling me to exert every effort to reunify Cyprus. My message from this podium to my Turkish Cypriot compatriots, to all Cypriots, is that I hear their call for peace. I understand their concerns, and I assure them that I will spare no effort to make our common dream of reunification and peace on our island a reality. And I want to be able to tell them that the world, the United Nations, the living words of the UN Charter also hear their call for peace. Excellencies, I stand in the General Assembly for the first time, fully aware of the responsibility that, that has been bestowed upon me to do my utmost to safeguard the future of the Cypriot people, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots alike, who want to end the division of their country, to coexist and to co-create. Working towards peace in Cyprus is my absolute priority, and I want to take today's opportunity to also send a personal message to President Erdogan. There is not and never will be another basis for a settlement of the Cyprus question to that dictated by the UN Security Council resolutions. Dear Mr. Erdogan, illegality stemming from invasion, aggression, and the use of force cannot be recognized. Cyprus and Turkey are neighbors bound by geography. Peace in Cyprus will send a resounding message of peace in a region and a world that desperately needs it. It will also change the geopolitical map of our neighborhood with a ripple effect in Europe, the wider Eastern Mediterranean, and throughout EU-Turkey relations. Gunboat diplomacy and strong arm tactics belong to the past. They are not the tools of visionary leaders. This is our time to bring the UN Charter to life, a charter of peace between and among us. No one stands to gain from conflict and division. We and the generations that will come after us stand to gain from dialogue, from good neighborly relations. So Mr. Erdogan, let us work together by a vision of peace. Let us build a brighter future for our countries through dialogue and respect for international legalities, legality. Ladies and gentlemen, in this great hall, we all feel the weight of history on our shoulders. The great women and men who have given us this organization and institutions expect us to strengthen them, to strengthen them grow them, and to take personal responsibility for their future. I'm here today with clarity of purpose and determination. The sole effective medium to address this risk of instability generated by the absence of a peace path 
is to pave one, to foster dialogue through which positions and concerns of all sides can be addressed and discussed in good faith. I stand ready to negotiate boldly and courageously on the Cyprus question in good faith, always within the agreed UN framework that call for a bizonal, bicommunal federation with political equality as defined by the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. At the time when international legality is under attack, international law, the UN Security Council resolutions must be prevailed. I'm committed to negotiating a settlement that will safeguard the fundamental freedoms and human rights, the interests of all my Cypriot compatriots, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, Maronites, Armenians, and Latins, all equal. A comprehensive settlement that will allow them to prosper in coexistence and peace, free of any anachronistic dependencies and system of guarantees that have no place in a European country. That is why resumption of peace negotiations based on the agreed framework, preserving the ideas of the previous round of negotiations is essential. As the UN Security Council has resolved, it is high time for the United Nations to become a driving force of dialogue by appointing, as a first step, an envoy on the Cyprus problem to explore and prepare the ground for the resumption of negotiations. The United Nations and its Secretary General have the responsibility prescribed in the UN Charter to act as a catalyst for peace in Cyprus. In doing so, it can be facilitated by the European Union, which also has the tools necessary and which has expressed its commitment to deliver so as to reunify its last divided member state. Just like the United Nations, the European Union is also a project of peace. The Union can and must act decisively with all means at its disposal to drive reunification of its last divided member state, and in doing so, contribute to peace in Europe, the wider Middle East, and indeed the world. Distinguished delegates, the theme of this year's General Assembly focuses on, on the 2030 Agenda and its sustainable development goals towards peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability for all. The achievements of the SDGs requires universal efforts and transformative solutions. Climate emergency and climate change, no, no borders. On our region, the Eastern Mediterranean is especially vulnerable in this regard. The raging wildfires and the floods during the summer are a somber reminder of the fact that we are failing to act at our own peril. We have regrettably all observed nature's wrath from the storming countries of our region and in countries such as Libya in which thousands so tragically lost their lives. To this end, Cyprus is actively participating in a new international climate change initiative to address the specific needs and, change, and challenges countries are facing in our neighborhood to advance mitigation actions. The Climate Ambition Summit taking place today is a critical milestone in confirming our collective political will towards achieving the transition to a climate resilient global economy. At the same time, recognizing that human rights are essential for lasting peace and sustainable development, we must ensure that they guide the solutions to our challenges. The international human rights agenda is a priority policy for Cyprus, and it is exactly for this reason that, that we announce our candidacy for the Human Rights Council for the period 2025-2027. As an European Union member state, we are committed to action against gender-based violence, and we have also joined the Secretary General's Circle of Leadership on the prevention of and response to sexual exploitation and abuse in the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1946, Winston Churchill declared that the dangers and difficulties in establishing conditions of freedom and democracy and permanently preventing war 
will not be removed by closing our eyes to them, nor by a policy of appeasement to aggressors. What is needed is real action, and the longer this is delayed, the more difficult it will be, and the greater the dangers will become. Cyprus is at the crossroads of Europe and the Middle East, in part of the world that is no stranger to conflict and instability. We are, however, convinced that the Eastern Mediterranean and the wider Middle East are changing the narrative of being a region in turmoil. We can become a hub of stability, peace, and cooperation, an exemplar of the change capable in the 21st century. Cyprus seeks to, act, seeks to act as a facilitator for this common vision and has come together with its immediate neighbors, with Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, and Greece, building a solid network of cooperation that is underpinned by a vision to make the Mediterranean Sea a sea of peace, cooperation, and prosperity. We shall continue on this path of multilateralism anchored on respect for international legality, and we call on all countries of the region that share these values to join us. This is, after all, the essence of the guiding principles that founded the United Nations 78 years ago. Peace. I come before you today asking for us all to work together toward peace. It is nothing new or groundbreaking, but it's a world changing, and we need to remind ourselves every day that it is within our reach and our responsibility. Thank you very much for your attention. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Cyprus for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Haige Gengov, President of the Republic of Namibia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Heige Gaingov, President of the Republic of Namibia, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Your Excellency, Mr. Dennis Francis, President of the 78th Session of the General Assembly, Your Excellencies, Head of State and Government, Your Excellency, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, distinguished delegates, allow me to use this opportunity to pledge to you the commitment of Namibia to support the priorities you have set out, namely peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability. Namibia would like to thank your predecessor, His Excellency Shaba Korosi for steering with diligence the work of the 77th session of General Assembly. Let me state that Namibia agrees with Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who a few months ago said, quote unquote, unless we act now, the 2030 agenda will become an epitaph for a world that might have been. Therefore, the theme of this session, quote, rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity, accelerating action on the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals towards peace, progress, and sustainability for all is fitting. With the onset of COVID-19, the number of people living in ex extreme poverty rose for the first time in a generation. It demonstrates that the fact at midpoint to the global goals, we face the stark reality that we will miss our goals and targets. This 78th session 
serves as a clarion call to reset and to work in the true spirit of partnership for better results on the ground. Indeed, the world is in a state of flux and progress, and progress is uneven. Taking cognizance of the interconnectivity between all the goals and targets, we should accelerate investments in healthcare, renewable energy, education, clean water, and sanitation. The terrifying gap between wealthy and the marginalized is not just a moral concern, but also a threat to political stability and harmony. We are therefore duty bound to create an environment where prosperity is shared and is inclusive. In our collective pursuit of the 2030 agenda, Namibia looks forward with hope and optimism to the summit of the future next year as an opportunity to prioritize meaningful reforms that can reinvigorate the global goals to give impetus to the broader system-wide UN reform agenda. Namibia also welcomes UN 2.0 and a quantity of change aiming to provide the United Nations family with the cutting edge capabilities in data, digital innovation, and ex expertise in order to deliver better and effective member state support to accelerate development. Mr. President, the health of a nation is a bedrock for all developmental activities. This morning, the General Assembly will adopt a political declaration on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Pandemics have long been formidable adversaries that disproportionately wreak havoc in the socioeconomic fabric of developing countries. These crises go beyond their immediate health implications unraveling years of development pro process, progress, straining healthcare systems, and exacerbating existing socioeconomic disparities. We need to change the status quo. To do so, we must end vaccine apartheid. We need to ensure equitable access to health products. We need stronger commitments from healthy countries on technology transfer and on the removal of intellectual property barriers and on investments in manufacturing to go to enable vaccine production in the global south. Mr. President, I always say that inclusivity spells harmony and exclusivity spells, spells conflict. The continued advocacy for gender equality is a core in our collective journey towards a just and inclusive world. Therefore, advocating for gender equality is not only a matter of fairness. It is an essential step towards unlocking innovation, diversity, and social cohesion. We are indeed proud to be ranked by the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report of 2023 as number eight, number eight country in the world for the efforts to close the gender gap. In addition, in addition to having 44% female representation in parliament, we have women in the positions of prime minister, deputy prime minister, and current Deputy Prime Minister has been selected by the ruling party to be the candidate. And very soon after I leave, in a year's time, she may be the one to come and stand here, who is here with us. And, and two thirds of our key banking institutions are headed by women. 
In the same vein, we believe in promoting inclusive and effective governance that ensures that the youth are integrated into decision-making structures to play their part in the future they have helped to shape. Mr. President, rapid advances in technology, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence are transforming the global landscape, offering unprecedented challenges and opportunities for growth and development. Therefore, developing countries should not be left behind in this digital revolution. Access to technology can bridge gaps in education, healthcare, and economic development, propelling nations towards progress. We must navigate technological challenges and harness opportunities by fostering an environment that is conducive to technology transfer, technology adoption, skills development, and collaboration. As we march towards COP28 for the final global stock take, we are acutely aware that the energy transition is not only a necessity for the combating climate change, but also an opportunity for economic development. Consistent with their pledges made at the Paris Climate Summit in 2015, developed nations must provide financial and technological support to enable developing countries to shift to cleaner energy sources without hampering development. Three years ago, during the 78th General Assembly, Namibia boldly announced its intention to change its economic structure by leveraging innovative financial tools to mobilize sustainable climate financing to combat climate change. One year later in Glasgow, Scotland, on the margins of COP26, COP we announced the development of large-scale green hydrogen projects that will provide the world with the clean monocles needed to decarbonize hard to abate sections. Today, we have more than five such projects under development, looking to deploy more than 20 billion US dollars in order to develop our world-class renewable energy potential to give our future generations a, fit, a fighting chance against warming climate. President, developing a new synthetic fuels industry in Namibia is not just an opportunity to fight climate change, but indeed offers an unparalleled opportunity for green industrialization. Namibia has now attracted new industries that are looking to make use of the cheap, clean electricity and molecules that shall be produced in Namibia. One such pioneering example is Oshibala project by High Iron, which plans to use Namibian produced green hydrogen to deliver the first industrial produ production of iron at net zero emissions. During the first phase of the project in 2024, an annual output of 15,000 tons of direct reduced iron is planned. Oshivala will be one of the biggest primary production sites of green iron worldwide and is expected to sequestrate 27,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, equivalent to 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions of Namibia's entire power industry today. In order to transport the clean molecules to their final destination, shipping, which is yet another hard to abate sector will also need to deploy innovative solutions. This is why Namibia is now developing green shipping corridors with Mars, McKinney, Mola, Center for Zero Carbon Shipping as we, as we look to map and fund the development of carbon neutral maritime value chains from production, transportation, storage, and consumption of clean fuels and carbon-free products made in Namibia and traded with the world. We are working with Campaign Maritime Belge, a shipping company from Belgium, 
were plans to build a clean ammonia bungering facility in Wolfish Bay at a cost of more than 2.2 billion euro in partnership with Namibia's own old harbor and lease company. On the 28th of September 23, this partnership named Plenary as expected to reveal plans to construct their first Namibian green hydrogen multimodal service station. I always say that you do not make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. Punitive measures imposed for over half a century on the Republic of Cuba have brought untold hardships that have disenfranchised the Cuban people. The embargo against the Cuban people remains unjust and must therefore be lifted. Namibia appeals to the United States of America to remo remove the Republic of Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, as there is no evidence to support such classification. Selective punitive measures against Zimbabwe and Venezuela must also be lifted, as these measures constitute the greatest obstacle to the implementation of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The United Nations Charter remains an important source of inspiration, reflecting the com commonality, agreed upon values of diplomacy and peaceful coexistence. We regard the Charter enshrined rights to self-determination for all peoples as essential. This rings true for the people of Western Sahara. While our right to self-determination has been upheld, the people of Western Sahara continue to remain under occupation. We recall how Morocco supported our right to self-determination, and now we call on them to do the same for the people of Western Sahara. Similarly, the people of Palestine yearn to transition from the inhuman conditions of oppressive rule Namibia is therefore pleased with the decision of the General Assembly to submit to the International Court of Justice a request for an advisory opinion on legal consequences arising from the ongoing violation by Israel of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. Mr. President, the challenges we face today are not insurmountable. By holding hands and by renewing our commitment to multilateralism, we can reverse the worst effects of the unprecedented global challenges of global warming, global inequality, pandemics, and conflicts. By holding hands, we have it within us to act now and to build the world we want in that world no one should feel left out. I thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Namibia for the statement made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Klaus Werner Johannes, President of Romania. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Klaus Werner Johannes, President of Romania, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, the world as we know it is enduring profound ground. We continue to defend our core values, the United Nations Charter, and effective multilateralism. Our decisions are critical for the future of humanity. We, the leaders, are called on now to take decisive actions for the generations to come 
in a spirit of solidarity and shared responsibility and stand up for rules-based international order and for the full respect of international law. Ladies and gentlemen, Romania is a direct neighbor to the continued war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine, and we acted with all our energy to bring a solid contribution to regional and international security and stability. This war demonstrated that the Black Sea needs more global attention, as it is of strategic importance for transatlantic security. Romania also stands for more efficient multilateralism alongside like-minded partners across the globe in the fight for freedom and democracy. Since day one of the war, Romania has acted in full solidarity with the brave Ukrainian people. We will continue to provide safe haven and protect refugees coming from our neighbor as we did for over six million Ukrainians who already crossed our borders. We fully support the Ukrainian peace formula as the most suitable framework conducive to a fair, lasting, and sustainable peace. We also support the pursuit of international law and accountability so that all those responsible for atrocities are brought to justice. Ladies and gentlemen, our region, the wider Black Sea area, must be protected against the effects of Russia's war against Ukraine and its hybrid war and malign interference. Romania has been constantly arguing on the need to keep the so-called protracted or frozen conflicts in the region high on our agenda. Romania has also been at the forefront of supporting in a multidimensional manner, the vulnerable partners in the region. We have thus offered substantial support to our neighbor, the Republic of Moldova, the country most affected by the war after, of course, Ukraine itself. Ladies and gentlemen, while we work in the present to defend our values, we should also continue to project a sustainable future we thus continue to actively pursue the 2030 Agenda. Food insecurity, energy, and economic instability affect the entire world, and especially the most vulnerable in the global south. By terminating the Black Sea Grain Initiative and by attacking Ukrainian ports, Russia further exacerbates the global food crisis. We once again urge the Russian Federation to cease blocking the initiative. As a direct neighbor of Ukraine and a responsible and solidary international actor, Romania has played an active role in the global efforts on food security. Since the beginning of the war, we have facilitated the delivery of more than 25 million tons of Ukrainian grain. Romania will not let down our most vulnerable partners who need our support, especially those from least developed countries, including from Africa. We also invest and bring our contribution for African institutional resilience, peacekeeping, and capacity building. Ladies and gentlemen, through our sustainable development strategy, we advance an efficient, transparent, and citizen-centered governance. Our second voluntary national review issued this July is proof that we are on the right track, as we already achieved 62% of our national targets for 2030. But as we are keenly aware that globally we are lagging behind, we put trust in the Sustainable Development Goals Summit and the Summit of the Future. We are also aware of the importance of financing for development. Romania is committed 
to increase its official development assistance to 0.33% of its GDP by 2030. Moreover, we will contribute to the European Union's objective to allocate 0.2% of its collective official development aid to the, last, to the least developed countries. Distinguished audience, the devastating effects of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss, as well as energy insecurity and disinformation are our global concerns. Romania's efforts in combating these challenges are visible. For instance, we are committed to swiftly ratify and implement the agreement on marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. We were also part of the core group promoting the General Assembly's request for an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states in respect of climate change. We remain vocal in supporting climate education, a priority for Romania and for me personally. I also strongly believe that the climate and security nexus should be more prominent on the United Nations agenda, including in the Security Council. We hope that the Climate Ambition Summit and the COP28 will mobilize the political will to keep the 1.5 target alive. We must accelerate a just energy transition and emissions reduction while ensuring energy security Countering disaster risks also requires joint efforts, and the Emergency Platform Initiative is a step in the right direction. Romania actively participates in international assistance missions, shares best practices, and offers training on response measures. In our endeavors, we should use the opportunities brought by digitalization, innovation, and new technologies, as well as the strategic investments in renewables as enablers of sustainable development. At the same time, Romania welcomes the Secretary General's initiative for a code of conduct for information integrity on digital platforms. Distinguished audience, in the current geopolitical context, the key for an efficient multilateralism is to ensure its successful reform, which cannot be delayed any longer. An enlarged Security Council could include important additional voices from the African group, from various small island developing states, and even from the smallest regional group, the Eastern European one. As we celebrate 75 years since the adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, Romania strongly advocates for strengthening the UN human rights system, including for its adequate funding. As a member of the Human Rights Council, we continue to be an active supporter of democracy, rule of law, non-discrimination, freedom of expression, children's and women's rights. At the same time, the full respect and promotion of international law remain at the very core of our foreign policy. As an example, Romania is advocating for an enlarged acceptance by states of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, and we count on your support for our solid candidature for the World Court. Dear colleagues, next year's Summit of the Future represents an excellent opportunity to find joint global solutions. The Pact for the Future must provide the United Nations with the tools to deliver for us and for future generations. We must stand for our people and for the future we want. I thank you.
On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of Romania for the statement made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear address by His Excellency Chandrika Prasad Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome my own President, His Excellency Chandrika Prasad Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname, and, I, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, President of the General Assembly, Secretary of the United Nations, Excellencies, Heads of Delegations, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Mr. President, I'm proud to observe that this August body is under dedicated leadership of our Caribbean sister nation, Trinidad and Tobago, and that a distinguished citizen and experienced diplomat of that country is at the helm of the 78th session of the General Assembly. Mr. President, this is my fourth statement to this global body, and since then, I'm afraid to conclude that not much has changed for the better regarding the essential elements of peace, prosperity, and climate in our world. On the other hand, the challenges and crises have increased and deepened. I do not need to mention this crisis because we know them all and repeat them every single time we speak to an international and regional audience. And the more important and relevant matter at hand is what do we do about? We make promises not often kept. We express noble goals but the delivery is poor. This cannot go on. Business as usual cannot be our mantra. No country is spared of the effects of this crisis, especially developing countries like my own country, Suriname. And no country can solve these challenges alone. It is worth mentioning that we humans are responsible for this crisis and we must take responsibility for them, and we must also express collective leadership to solve these problems effectively. A new approach of the conceptualizing our relationships is needed to adequately address this crisis. A new kind of multilateralism that is more just, effective, and forces us to unite. One that will demonstrate respect and commitment to international law and cooperation. It is therefore of utmost importance to transcend national interests and look to our common goals, and we must put aside ideological differences to constructively deliver for the prosperity of our people and the protection of our planet. We simply cannot that upholding firm commitments to international principles and international law, the principles of the United Nations Charter, and effective multilateralism are a conditio sine qua non to address these global challenges and threats. The role of the United Nations in defense and upholding of these principles through dialogue, constructive engagement, and concrete action remains crucial. Therefore, a strong, determined, and united United Nations is a must. Mr. President, the multiple global and national crises, such as debt burden, domestic effects of climate change, the financial economic downturn following the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of the raging war in Ukraine have put tremendous pressure 
on the implementation of the SDGs on a major scale. Limited financial and technical resources had to be allocated for many emergencies just to make sure that no one was left behind. Mr. President, let us remember that building resilience and leaving no one behind is not a choice. I want to reiterate that for small de developing countries with a low-lying coastal area, the fiscal pressure due to other crises beyond our doing is a real and a daily problem. However, I remain of the few that the earmarked transformation envisioned by the 2030 SDG agenda remains both possible and essential. Mr. President, as we know, food security is a major challenge. And just a few, do few days ago in Cuba, I stressed the importance of science, technology, and innovation to increase food production and optimize the inputs needed to make agriculture more productive. And during my visit, Mr. President, I personally experienced the negative impact of the long-standing embargo, an embargo that does not achieve what it was meant for. The CARICOM Food Security Program is an example to reduce the region's food import bill by 25% by the year 2025 and promote local production with modern technology. Mr. President, the reach and impact of digital technologies will only continue to increase in the coming years, and it is crucial that the benefits of this innovation are leveraged to ensure an accessible, transparent, safe, and secure, digitally transformative environment. To implement this comprehensive strategy in a coherent manner, my country has recently designed and adopted a national digital strategy 2023-2030. Mr. President, the political, humanitarian, and security environment in Haiti is deteriorating. While I appreciate the efforts made so far to assist in finding an immediate solution, much more political efforts need to be made to translate the intentions into real actions. The people of Haiti are looking toward a regional and international community for assistance. At the same time, the Haitian stakeholders, which are divided in opposing groups, must demonstrate the will to dialogue and reach consensus for a way forward in the shortest time possible. Mr. President, another climate conference of the parties, COP28, is on our doorstep. As, as we are amidst in the reality of the increased intensity of the devastating global impact of climate change, it is regrettable to admit that despite some efforts, the world is still far from reaching the required level of emissions. And to prevent irreversible damage to our global environment and society. And we are bearing the brunt. While Suriname currently is, ex is experiencing extraordinary high temperatures, resulting in challenges with regard to the availability of drinking water, inland areas are increasingly flooded by heavy rainfall and coastal areas are threatened by the rising of the seawater level. As a consequence, the people living in remote parts of our fast interior are deprived of work, education, basic utilities, and food security is under threat. As one of the only three carbon negative countries in the world, 
Suriname remains committed and continues to play its part in protecting the planet through national actions, but also through engaging in strategic international public and private partnerships that will contribute to remaining carbon negative for now and also for the future. We cannot go to Dubai in less than two months and hear the same analysis, the same stories, the same policies, the same speeches with noble goals, the same promises, and after that, nothing happens. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, it takes too long to make the required decisions that will have a meaningful impact and all will improve our living conditions. We need easier access to climate financing to implement mitigation and adaptation policies. We must walk the talk regarding loss and damage. We must join efforts that call for compensating highly forested countries for the so-called removal credits as these countries so far have acted as carbon sinks for the whole world without any compensation. Mr. President, many of us have raised the urgent and comprehensive reform of the international financial architecture as the foremost criti critical issue to address the economic, financial, and environmental challenges faced by developing countries. An integral part of this reform process must include the discussion on new ways of classifying countries. And I ask all of us to contribute to the proposed multidimensional vulnerability index. Mr. President, my country, Suriname, is at the cusp of promising commercial development of newfound new oil and gas resources. These developments and also the capital generation will allow us to provide for our population a social health and education system that will facilitate increased production in other sectors, creating a sustainable future for the current and the next generations. Suriname has over the past three years gone through a financial and economic reform process whereby my country people, citizens, had to sacrifice in many ways. Coupled with the COVID pandemic, the impact of climate change, the effects of war in Eastern Europe, and a high debt burden, the impact on the people in my country was even worse. I want to assure that the international community that my government is committed to remain a carbon negative country with an enormous biodiversity pool and a low deforestation level. During the Amazon summit held last month in Belém do Pará in Brazil, we and seven other countries have committed to a better management of the Amazon region. We committed to even stopping deforestation by the year 2030. We are committed to the application of high international environmental standards so that the impact of the environment can be minimized. Mr. Chair, we do this to finance our committed transition to an economy that is primarily based on renewable, non-carbon-based energy generation by 2060. I announce with a certain degree of pride that we recently registered our carbon credits for the first time on the UNFCCC registry. That was done with our own, albeit limited, capabilities and we shall see how the market responds to these new resources. All these commitments are made to contribute to saving the planet and life on Earth. But I call on 
all heavy polluters to start with this process as well, and not to try to manage tax or punish environmental friendly production in developing countries which are at least res responsible for the climate crisis. Real change must particularly come from the more developed countries. In closing, Mr. President, together, let us harness our collective strengths, knowledge, determination to create a world where resilience and inclusivity are not just aspirations, but realities. Only through joint efforts, we can build a future where no one is left behind and where the sustainable development goals become a shining beacon of hope and progress for all. We owe this to the current and future generations. And I, I appeal to all of us to work constructively and collectively towards a better and a new world order and to recommit to the original goals of the Charter of the United Nations. But now, ladies and gentlemen, with more dedication, with more passion, and with more love for each other. I thank you, and may God bless you all. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Suriname for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Shalko Komsik, Chairman of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Shalko Komsik, Chairman of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, building on the theme of this year's session of the United Nations General Assembly, which is rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity, accelerating action on the 2030 Agenda and its sustainable development goals towards peace, prosperity, progress and sustainability for all. At this important place, allow me to talk about important elements from the point of view of a small yet proud state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. For this part, Bosnia and Herzegovina has given support to the 2030 Agenda, especially its goals that to the greatest extent concern the creation of the world and the environment in the United Nations member countries in a way that we as states and their societies are prepared and specially trained to implement all the steps that will lead us to self-sustainable development. However, in today's world, often dominated by war and various geopolitical goals, it will be very difficult to achieve this, at least in a way as it is planned in the 2030 Agenda. For this reason, I specifically wish to emphasize that the first steps which we must start our activities with is the one that will lead us to permanent peace as the world's priority number one, and then to other mutually related activities in order to have our countries and societies ready for solidarity and progress. These activities are by no means and they, easy and they require lots of wisdom, planning and good management of all processes and procedures that can lead us to the implementation of the Agenda 2030. If we start from the premise offered by the theme of this year's session of the United Nations General Assembly, which talks about building trust and encouraging global solidarity, then I feel free to point out in few sentences the elements that could possibly make achieving these goals difficult. At the very beginning, 
I take this opportunity to remind you that migrations are one of the elements of the Agenda 2030, trying to be dealt with, with systematically and with specific governance. Although the Agenda for Sustainable Development until 2030 recognizes migrants as agents of change and development in countries of their origin, transit and destination, the Agenda primarily focuses on migrants as beneficiaries of Sustainable Development Goals through a higher level of protection of their rights and transparency. Furthermore, the Agenda does not refer to a broader concept of diaspora or to the role that it plays as a possible means of development. This statement, extracted from one of the IOM's documents, the National Organization for Migration, is most certainly true. But when it comes to the starting point of migration, that is, go out into the field of certain countries, then we will certainly see several things that are undeniably happening. The current form of migration management has reached such a stage where large and powerful countries, for their own benefit, carry out a certain type of selection of migrants in such a way as to select the best and most educated among them, such as doctors, engineers, scientists, and other highly qualified persons, and are ushering them to larger countries where their knowledge and abilities are exploited exclusively for the benefit of these larger systems. In larger countries and larger systems, such selected migrants can be agents of change or bearers of various improvements, but at the same time, the potentials and capacities of smaller countries from which the migrants come from are being weakened. Small countries, in addition to losing their best quality personnel, are also losing all investments made, including the financial ones, the investments made in creating these highly qualified profiles. Of course, it is completely clear that there is such a form of migration in which large groups of people are trying to escape war and horrors of war. But there is also what we call economic migration, through which migrants are being directed based on their potential and capacity. In both cases of migration, large countries and their larger systems are the ones who are doing the selection and choosing the best profiles of migrants in line with their needs and aspirations, while at the same time the systemic weakening of small countries from which the migrants come from is taking place. So what do I mean by this? In short, it is difficult to talk about building trust while larger countries and their large systems are taking over the population of smaller countries to migration, and simultaneously the smaller countries are emptying out, resulting in the creation of an environment in which poverty develops and completely prevents any form of development in economic and social sense. Thus, a direct attack is made on the possibility of creating prerequisite for self-sustainable development in smaller countries. From the point of view of my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's very easy to provide additional arguments and proof confirming this matter. In my country, there is a significant outlaw of population going to larger and more developed countries, mostly to countries we view as Western democratic countries. While investigating why our people, Bosnian and Herzegovinians, decide to leave their country and look for better living conditions in some other countries, we came to a conclusion that the fundamental reason for their departure is their conviction of the lack of perspective in Bosnia and Herzegovina. When we took into account that our people have stated as one of the basic shortcomings of the perspective in their country, we saw that it refers to how specifically the political system in Bosnia and Herzegovina does not entail complete democracy, but rather a form of ethnocracy or a system in which elections for government institutions, exercise of power, distribution of jobs in the state, even in the real sector, are primarily based on ethnicity as a prerequisite. In such a system, you usually don't have the best people in key positions 
people who, with their knowledge and abilities, can build a political, economic, and social system in Bosnia and Herzegovina. On the contrary, you have ethnically and politically suitable staff who can hardly be expected to lead the overall progress of the country. This value system has been going on for a very long time. In such a system, the key jobs are not performed by the best and most qualified people, but by the politically and ethnically suitable ones. The current political system in Bosnia and Herzegovina, based exclusively on ethnic and then on political affiliation, completely degrades democracy as an important principle for creating an environment with equal opportunities for all people. Such a system, which guarantees participation in government to certain political actors and their ethnically based political parties, has the form of former and current totalitarian systems in which power is exercised in an autocratic manner through autocratically inspired political actors. As a result of this unfinished political system, we have a slow development of the country while such politics obstruct what, in my opinion, is one of the key goals of my country, its, its path to membership in larger supranational systems such as the European Union or NATO alliance. The irremovability or particularly difficult replaceability of the authorities creates such an environment where even the authorities themselves no longer work for the benefit of their citizens because they feel that there is no need for such a thing. The distribution of power and social power is already guaranteed to them in advance by system itself, a system based on ethnicity. Our current political system is skillfully using is simply used by our Western and Eastern neighbors and through ethnic communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to which they claim national rights, they are running Bosnia and Herzegovina not with the primary aim of helping the members of these ethnic communities, but with the aim of dividing Bosnia and Herzegovina or making it meaningless as a state. Our two neighbors, through the ethnic communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to which they, are, which they strive to claim every right, even 27 years after the aggression they had carried out over Bosnia and Herzegovina, are in this manner making an attack on the sovereignty of our country, which makes it almost completely impossible to have any democratic development of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This practice also violates the minimum of industry trust because unfortunately, our neighbors are not investing sincere energy with the goal of building interstate cooperation, but are rather investing energy in weakening our state. This is a visible problem, which extends to the entire region of the Western Balkans, where there are different ideas, plans, and intentions to change the internationally recognized borders, to reorganize the region, into something that has no point of contact with democracy. For such activities and policies, neighboring countries very often have, at first glance, surprising and unexpected support from countries that we consider to be democratic liberal states and societies, but certainly also from those that are not democratic and that we recognize today as aggressor states with authoritarian regimes. Regretfully, there are many, both in the East and the West, who believe that their barely hidden support for those who want to completely control and ultimately divide Bosnia and Herzegovina will bring stability to the Western Balkans. We, who represent the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina here at the United Nations, believe that this will not bring either stability or progress in the Western Balkans. Our neighbors cannot divide Bosnia and Herzegovina amongst themselves without entering into mutual conflict. We will certainly not allow the division and disappearance of our thousand-year-old state at any cost, no matter what anyone thinks about it. That is why I believe that it's in the interest of the United Nations, if peace is to be preserved in the Western Balkans, to support the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina and its institutions. 
If the United Nations wish it to preserve peace in the Western Balkans, then it should support those who have not violated democratic and civilization norms, who have not committed genocide, who were not part of joint criminal enterprises, did not destroy people's lives of their ethnicity, because of their ethnicity, did not destroy other people's temples or shrines, did not advocate revengeism or revenge. If such support is absent, then the responsibility and blame for this destabilization does not lie with us, who will certainly not calmly and idly observe some new attempt to destroy our Bosnia and Herzegovina. However, the fundamental problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina lies in, in the in inequality of citizens in the political and electoral system, the result of which is an ethnic system of governing the country, a system that is destined to be conflictual in itself. In addition, the ethnic system of exercising power in my country continuously creates space for nepotism and corruption in all segments of society, especially in government institutions. As a consequence of the ethnic system of exercising power, we have a nepotism in the selection of people to perform the most important political and economic jobs. The ethnic political system in my country is the one that generates and encourages nepotism and corruption the most, and nepotism and corruption destroy social cohesion and trust within a society the most. That is why we, for decades, have not been able to create a society of equals, and with that, a society of equal opportunities, because with the employment through family connections and corruption pertaining to most important positions, one loses hope on the possibility of having positive perspective. From this place, I want to ask an important question, and allow me to do this. How is it possible to build and achieve trust that will lead to the creation of prerequisite for development when we don't actually have enough democracy in our country? When our right to democracy is being taken away and when an embargo to democracy is being imposed upon us, which leads citizens to great uncertainty and is the reason why they often decide to leave the country. The latest interventions of the international representatives in Bosnia and Herzegovina, like the intervention of the high representative, by means of legal violence and the suspension of the entity constitution for 24 hours, which is an inconceivable precedent, precedent in the democratic world, did not remove obstacles to the normal functioning of the state, but rather strengthened the undemocratic ethnic principle and deepened the discrimination of citizens in the constitution and the electoral law. Democracy is the most important segment for building trust, both in our countries and globally. It is very important in order to create prerequisites for self-sustainable development that a transition in these societies ends as soon as possible. Through the transition from former totalitarian autocratic systems to a system based on full democracy. That is why we expect the support of actors from the international community, even though they occasionally resort to undemocratic tools, while like they occasionally completely deny the possibility of development of democracy in Bosnia and Herzegovina for the sake of their goals. Of course, we are fully aware that there is a number of countries, members of the United Nations, with which such history and historical context, that they are not interested in democracy and its development. On the other hand, some indicators tell us that over two-thirds of the countries, members of the United Nations, are oriented towards democracy and its development, so my point of view is oriented in that direction as well. I wish to add another important element here, which is indispensable in building trust for self-sustainable development. It is achieving a system of full human rights, which, as its form, final outcome, offers a society of equal people, equal citizens, and as a result of that, we can have a society of equal chances with open perspectives for everyone. If you do not have a system of equals, that is, equal citizens, then it will be difficult to build trust in such a system, especially in a still post-war society such as in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Particularly 
if you have in mind that our society has suffered aggression from our Western and Eastern neighboring countries, a direct consequence of which were the committed atrocious war crimes and even the crime of genocide. Such scenarios for Bosnia and Herzegovina continue to be implemented through political means this time, in peacetime conditions, while continuously asking for support from various parts of the international community. At the same time, and regardless of the aforementioned scenarios, our obligation is to create internal prerequisite for building a society of equal people and equal citizens, and one of the basic tools that will enable us to avoid the possibility of future conflicts. Contained within the judgments of the eminent courts that deal with the protection of human rights, such as the European Court of Human Rights, there is a valuable resource for building a stable society in which the risk of internal conflict is reduced to a minimum. But potentially, aggressive policies are being, we take away an efficient mechanism to violate territorial integrity and sovereignty of Bosnia and Herzegovina from neighboring countries. In short, this means that we in Bosnia and Herzegovina will have to change the entire paradigm within society and shift from ethnic political representation to civic political representation, which is a standard in a democratic world. We must use this opportunity to draw attention of the United Nations on something that is, in my opinion, and I'm sorry to say this, a very uncivilized stand of the government and the prime minister of our neighboring country who have rejected the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights the, in the latest judgment in the Kovacevic case and have stood up for the very principles that were rejected in the mentioned judgment, like the political principle of legitimate representation based on ethnicity, which is a generator of inequality among the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the means by which the neighbors undermine the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This was done in such a way that it can be qualified as an interference in the internal affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The disrespect of the judgments of the international courts, as could be heard from the prime minister of a neighboring country, is reminiscent of the attitudes towards international law that Vladimir Putin has built in the case of Ukraine. However, this is not only about having a negative attitude towards the international standards of the United Nations, but also a policy towards Bosnia and Herzegovina conducted by its neighbors. Only when civic political representation is accepted in Bosnia and Herzegovina through the implementation of the judgments of the European Court, and when in parallel the attacks on the sovereignty of the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina from the neighborhood stop, only then will we be able to participate in projects at full capacity and more efficiently, such as Agenda 2030, as an equal participant and actor of all planned activities. In that case, we, as a country, will be ready and equipped with potential to accept all the challenges posed before us by the self-sustainable development activities to build our mutual social trust and as a society of equals, and to, and to be an active actor in building trust on a global level. I believe you share my opinion in that, in societies dominated by inequality, you will not be able to be a legitimate actor in promoting ideas of self-sustainable development through building trust and global solidarity for all. For such a thing, it is necessary to, first of all, reform our society in a way in which we'll be able to understand the importance of solidarity for everyone with people who are equal in everything in that system and who can produce solidarity towards others on an equal grounds. In the conclusion of this address, in addition to everything previously stated, I would like to emphasize that Bosnia and Herzegovina will actively work on the implementation of Agenda 2030. We will work on building trust and solidarity for all. By rejecting discriminatory